You want a war? You're gonna get one. Forget the lies, the money. We're in this together and through it all. They said that nothing's forever. Welcome to the 50th episode of Reliving the War and welcome to the 23rd of September 1996. It's the night after In Your House Mind Games. WWF Raw is live tonight from Hershey, Pennsylvania, while WCW Nitro is live from Birmingham, Alabama. We are going to compare Raw and Nitro segments to see which show was the best, but before we do that, let's check out the results from In Your House Mind Games, along with the unopposed first 60 minutes of Monday Nitro. In Your House Mind Games took place in Philadelphia in front of around 13,000 fans held on the 22nd of September 96. ECW's Tommy Dreamer and The Sandman were set at ringside during the opening Caribbean strap match between Savio Vega and Bradshaw, and The Sandman spat beer on Vega before both ECW superstars were removed from their ringside seats. The WWF and ECW were working together here, starting a relationship that would see more ECW superstars show up in future WWF shows and vice versa. Savio won the match. Jim Cornette vs Jose Lothario is up next and it's very weird seeing Jose come out to Shawn Michaels entrance music and let's not talk about Cornette's ring gear. Jose got the win with <laughs> an uppercut and Cornette said he got paid really well for this match so yeah I can't think of any other reason why he'd do this. Brian Pullman and Owen Hart talked about Bret Hart next. Owen said Bret was supposed to be at Mind Games but he didn't show up because he's scared and the reason why Bret is scared is because Stone Cold Steve Austin is in the building. Austin taunts Bret saying if the hitman does indeed come back then he's gonna have to face Stone Cold. Owen then teamed up with brother-in-law Davy Boy Smith to defeat the Smoking Guns, meaning Bulldog and Owen are now the WWF Tag Team Champions. Billy Gunn was too busy talking to Sonny, and Billy effectively cost the Smoking Guns the Tag Team titles. After the bout, Sonny announced that she was leaving Billy and Bart, and what a terrible loss that is. Big Mark Henry was still pretty green when he took on Jerry Lawler next, but Henry managed to score a victory with a backbreaker submission. It was easily the worst match on the card. The Undertaker defeated Goldust after hitting the Tombstone Piledriver. The match kinda lacked any real heat and the audience were pretty quiet from bell to bell, only making noise when The Undertaker went through his usual moveset. And then we had the main event, Shawn Michaels vs Mankind and this turned out to be an excellent bout that Mick Foley ranks up there as one of his absolute best. Michaels said he needed to wrestle a guy like Foley to show he could get a little rough when needed. The white meat babyface stuff just wasn't working out and so Sean had a chance to actually fight here and the match turned out great because of it. Plenty of stiff shots, loads of dangerous bumps, Foley and Sean beat the hell out of each other and really I can't recommend this match enough. I want to cover it in a separate video soon so look out for that. HBK gets the win via disqualification when Vader runs in. Psycho Sid then showed up to chase away Vader, and then The Undertaker appeared from the same coffin that Mankind made his entrance in. Mankind escapes and The Undertaker follows, HBK celebrates in the ring to end the pay per view. And absolutely, go out of your way to watch the main event here. An above average pay per view that gets pushed into must see territory thanks to Mankind vs Shawn Michaels. It's announced at the end of the show that The Undertaker will face Mankind in the first ever Buried Alive match at next month's In Your House. We learned that a group of WCW superstars have travelled to New Japan this week. WCW wrestlers did indeed compete in some G1 Climax special shows in the Japan vs US All-Star Tournament in September of 96. Guys including Dean Malenko, Lex Luger, Eddie Guerrero, Rick Steiner, Ric Flair, 
Scott Norton, Chris Benoit, Arn Anderson, and even Sting. All these guys are not on Monday Nitro this week. And so our commentators speculate that the New World Order will try to take advantage tonight. The NWO even took out a newspaper ad in USA Today that says, While WCW's away, the NWO will play. That's some excellent work right there. People are shown again handing out NWO flyers backstage. And this one J-Brone right here cuts a promo before throwing the paper down. It's like, fuck off, Mark. Our opening match featured Conan and the Taskmaster defeating Brad Armstrong and Juventud Guerrera. Conan done all the legwork here while the Taskmaster scored the pinfall victory. Big Bubba and Sullivan beat the hell out of Conan afterwards, and the commentator said that this was Conan's initiation. Feels a little late for an initiation, but anyway, it was a short match and it didn't have much going for it. Randy Savage gets interviewed next. The Macho Man knows he's gonna get targeted tonight by the NWO, and Savage said he was actually booked for the New Japan shows, but he needed to be at Monday Nitro because he's not sure if he'll get beaten up or if he himself will do the beating up. I guess he just wanted to find out for himself. Chris Jericho defeated Mike Enos next in a decent matchup. Jericho's power slam counter at the end of the match was pretty nice, and it's a counter that you don't see too often. Glacier then defeated Pat Tanaka after performing a leg sweep that Tanaka sold perfectly and following up with a roundhouse kick. Glacier's entrance was longer than the match itself. The Public Enemy then defeated Harlem Heat for the WCW Tag Team titles, believe it or not. Booker T pinned Rock O Rock with a small package, but Rock was able to shift his weight and pin Booker T. The commentators tried to imply that Nick Patrick was up to his old tricks here, but it was the right call. Public Enemy are now the WCW Tag Team Champions. Raw gets the unopposed point this week. Not a whole lot happening on the WCW side, even with this tag team title change. Also, I've noticed some comments where people don't understand how Raw can win the unopposed point for doing nothing. And it comes down to WCW having that extra hour and failing to make the best of it. If the first 60 minutes of Nitro feels like a waste of time, then Raw gets the point. Also guys, don't take it so seriously. It's just a YouTube show. Raw kicks off with footage of Diesel and Razor Ramon at Mind Games. The two men were spotted backstage where they attacked Savio Vega. We go to the arena and Mr. Perfect is in the ring with Pat Patterson. Hennig is gonna commentate during this opening matchup while Pat Patterson is gonna be our referee. Jim Ross announces that Razor Ramon and Diesel are indeed in the building tonight and our first match then gets underway. It's the finals of the IC title tournament, Farouk vs Mark Merrow. Over on Nitro we have Randy Savage vs Greg the Hammer Valentine. Our crew guy down here is pretty damn excited to see Sable tonight as Farouk begins attacking Mero at the opening bell. Farouk maintains the advantage early on but Mero answers with a head scissors. Mero's follow up pin attempt only gets him a one count and Farouk replies by pulling off an enziguri. Farouk then punishes Mero in the corner before missing a diving shoulder tackle at the opposite turnbuckles. Mero hits back with an arm drag before sending Farouk over the top rope with a clothesline. The wild man then hits his somersault plancha as Sonny looks on. The action goes back inside the ropes where Mero hits a unique moonsault that Jim Ross calls the Mero Salt. Mero ends up getting dumped out of the ring and when he tries to get back inside, Farouk performs a jumping shoulder block. Mero hits the guardrail and then Ahmed Johnson calls in the Raw as our match continues. Ahmed says that Mero will need to get a little tougher if he's gonna beat Farouk. And when Jerry Lawler jokes about Ahmed getting his new kidney from Jake Roberts, Ahmed says he's coming after the king once he gets back to action. Farouk carries Mero to the turnbuckles and we see a Samoan drop from the middle rope. Pat Patterson then performs an incredibly slow two count and even the commentators mention how slow it was. What else is in there? One, two, how did he, what, uh... Fucking Pat Patrick right here, folks. Sonny tries to attack Mero and Sable saves her husband. When Patterson realizes what happened, he sends Sonny back to the locker room. We come back from a commercial break and Mero reverses a dominator attempt with a backslide. He only gets a two count. 
Ferg then replies by nearly taking Mero's head off. A Mega Man chinlock follows and Ferg stays in control when the hold gets broken. A long delayed sunset flip actually works and Ferg gets pinned but again only a 2 count. Chinlock 2 gets applied, I'm holding back guys, 3 strikes and he's out. And while Mero tries to break free, Jim Ross gets a little hot when Jerry Lawler talks about Diesel and Razor Ramon and how JR has maybe been misleading people for these past few weeks. Mero hits a jumping clothesline but his follow up elbow drop misses. Farouk goes to the top turnbuckle but the wild man throws himself into the ropes. Mero is then able to hit a Frankensteiner and the crowd eats it up. For a guy of Farouk's size he sure did throw himself across the ring. Mark only gets a 2 count here but it looks like Pat Patterson has sorted out his count speed. The two men were supposed to hit a double clothesline next but it looks like Farouk got the better of Mero. And then Sunny comes back down the ringside with her handbag. It's got some sort of weapon inside of course. When Sunny and Sable begin slapping each other around the crowd again goes nuts and back inside the ropes Mero is able to hit Farouk with the loaded handbag. Kinda reminds me of Hogan and Flair beating each other up with high heel shoes. Mero is then able to hit the wild thing shooting star press and we have a new intercontinental champion. Mark Mero wins via pinfall. It's revealed afterwards that Sunny had a brick in her purse and Jim Ross gets a few words with Mero before Raw moves on to its next segment. Mark thanks his inspiration, his motivation, his best friend, his partner in life in and out of the ring, his lover Sable. Mm -hmm. Mero also thanks Mr Perfect for all the wisdom he shared, that's the first time we've heard about that. And just before we move on to the next segment we get a look at Diesel and Razor Ramon's locker room door. As Greg Valentine and Randy Savage make their way down to the ring, Eric Bischoff announces that there's apparently another new NWO member getting revealed later tonight. Savage salutes the audience after making his entrance but Valentine doesn't want to waste any time tonight. The two men remove their entrance attires and the macho man goes straight to work on Valentine. The hammer takes a beating in the corner and he gets his face dragged across the top rope as Randy Savage takes control. A back elbow from Valentine stops Savage in his tracks and an elbow drop follows. A few strikes to the midsection then get delivered before Greg Valentine dumps the macho man out of the ring. Savage dashes back in but again he gets thrown out and the commentary team talk about how Savage is may be unfocused tonight due to the NWO. The two men fight on the outside and Eric Bischoff announces that Super Kolo dislocated his shoulder earlier in the evening during a dark match, so Kolo is going to be out of action for a little while. Valentine destroys Macho on the outside and Randy decides to pick up a steel chair. Valentine gets levelled outside the ring and when the competitors get back inside, Valentine takes another chair shot. The referee calls for the bell. Savage is about to launch the official out of the ring, but then the new world order show up. Scott Hall, Six, Kevin Nash and Ted DiBiase begin beating down the macho man. And so the NWO takeover of Monday Nitro has begun. Also this confirms that Nash and Hall are not on WWF Raw tonight. The first point goes to Raw, Mero vs Farouk was simply a better match. The NWO takeover continues on Nitro next while the WWF presents Owen Hart and Davey Boy Smith vs the Body Donnas. There's a few short promos on Raw before the match begins. We see Mark Merrow celebrating his title victory with a bunch of midcard guys and Kevin Kelly says that this party is going to continue all night long. Probably a party you wouldn't mind missing out on to be fair. And then Vince McMahon presents a video that's gonna expose Jeff Jarrett. Keep in mind that Jarrett had recently signed with World Championship Wrestling. Back at In Your House 2, Jeff Jarrett sang With My Baby Tonight and when Jeff sang the country song, he took the commentators of the WWF by surprise. He was actually a pretty good singer. Well, Vince McMahon tells us all right here that Jeff Jarrett did not sing the song, he was lip syncing. And next week we're going to find out who really sang the song and we're going to find out who the real Double J is. It reeks of Vince McMahon pettiness doesn't it? Just like the whole Razor and Diesel thing, it's Vince McMahon trying to take shots at WCW but completely forgetting that he has his own audience that he needs to cater for. 
Vince says that Jarrett walked out of the WWF because he was about to get exposed, exposed as the man who didn't sing with my baby tonight. Yeah. The new tag team champions Owen and Bulldog then against the Body Donnas. After Jim Cornette got battered at Mind Games, Clarence Mason took advantage by having Jim sign over Bulldog and Owen, so Clarence Mason is now managing the tag team champions. Owen and Zip start things off and everything is really crisp. Owen performs a handstand wrist lock counter while Zip manages to bring Owen down with a hammer lock. An ECW chant breaks out in the crowd and the fans are clearly distracted by something or someone in the audience. And just a few moments later, Taz shows up at ringside. He grabs a sign that says Sabu fears Taz and then we go straight to a commercial break. If you want to learn more about this, check out my ECW Invasion video, but for now, it's not very important. This was all worked by the way, the WWF and ECW had an agreement in place. Bulldog is in the ring with Skip when we come back, but Davey quickly tags in Owen. Skip pulls off a head scissors followed by an arm drag, and this leads to Owen tagging Davey back in. And as our match continues, Jim Cornette appears via split screen. The Louisville Slugger says that Clarence Mason ripped him off at Mind Games. Jim thought he was signing papers for Clarence to represent him while suing Jose Lothario, but clearly that wasn't the case. Clarence says that he did nothing wrong. It's also announced here that next week, Jim Cornette and Vader will take on Shawn Michaels and Jose Lothario in a tag team match. The Body Donnas have been doing a great job of taking care of Bulldog and Owen, but they can't keep Owen down for a three count. Owen throws Skip into the ropes and Davey hits the Body Donna with a knee to the back. Owen follows up with a spinning wheel kick and a sharpshooter. And our match is over. Clarence gets in the ring and he does his little super combo victory pose before Raw moves on to its next segment. And also, there was no Davy Boy chin locks this week. Sorry, guys. Macho Man was warned, but he didn't listen. The NWO are here, and Randy Savage is taking a beating. Savage takes an outsider's edge, and we see Miss Elizabeth standing at the entranceway looking very concerned. The Macho Man then takes a jackknife, and Kevin Nash says. It looks like we're taking over tonight. The Giant shows up wearing a waistcoat and holding a microphone, and the Giant introduces Hulk Hogan like Hulk was Elvis Presley. Give me a dun, 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 dun. You know what? Get rid of Jimi Hendrix. They should have just used this as Hollywood's entrance song. Then again, maybe not. Hollywood comes down to the ring and the Giant announces Hogan as the NWO World Heavyweight Champion. The Hulkster hits two leg drops on the Macho Man before Kevin Nash begins whipping Savage with a Slim Jim. Don't care what anybody says, that's funny. The Giant takes the Slim Jim and he begins tucking in. Hulk Hogan says he's used to the bright lights of Hollywood, but he's not used to the light shining on the Macho Man's bald head. So he's gonna do something about it. Hulk then proceeds to spray Savage's head with black spray paint before announcing that this is a complete takeover of WCW Monday Nitro. Kevin Nash and Scott Hall run to the commentary desk, but Eric Bischoff doesn't escape in time. Nash screams at Bischoff to sit down before the other NWO members surround Eric, giving poor Bischoff a serious amount of anxiety. The newest member of the NWO is then announced, Ted DiBiase security man, Vincent. Yeah, it isn't really an all elite faction now, is it? Vincent smacks Bischoff around a little before we go to commercial break. Can we take a break? Oh, no problem, man. When we come back, the NWO show off their very own race car. Kevin Nash announces that NASCAR driver Kyle Petty will be behind the wheel, and Kyle is also going to make an appearance next week on Nitro. Jim Powers and VK Wall Street make their way down to the ring for their scheduled match, but Nash and Hall decide to attack Powers while Wall Street walks back up the entranceway. The Giant then has some fun with Powers in the ring, and Randy Anderson decides that he's quitting right there and then. He's seen enough. 
This leads to Nick Patrick coming down and of course Nick will be more than happy to officiate the remaining matchups. Hulk Hogan's doing a little vandalism backstage as the giant continues to destroy Jim Powers. And look, Hogan bumps into the nasty boys while there's a split screen going on, you couldn't make it up. Hulk Hogan says that Nobs and Sags have always had his back and the Hulkster wants to talk a little business. Hogan gives Nobs and Sags the key to his hotel room and the nasty boys decide to leave Nitro in order to wait for Hogan after the show. I'm giving this point to Nitro, I know this kind of NWO stuff would soon get repetitive, but you have to remember, this was the very first time a complete takeover of Nitro happened, it was so different from anything that we'd seen before and it made you wonder what was going to happen next. As mentioned though, this kind of thing does get repetitive eventually. The WWF are going to begin hyping up the Buried Alive pay-per-view next while Jim Duggan takes on Big Ron Studd. The WWF shows some screenshots from mind games and we see Vader and Sid's run-ins during the main event. It's announced here that Psycho Sid will face Vader at Buried Alive and this match would end up getting billed as the Battle of the Power Bombs. I recently done a watch along for Patreon supporters where we watched the episode of Superstars that aired just before mind games and Vader was already beginning to use the power bomb to finish off his opponents, something he hadn't done so far during his tenure in the WWF. The Undertaker vs Mankind Buried Alive match is then formally announced. Kevin Kelly says that this will be a non-sanctioned match and the loser will get buried alive. Extremely intriguing stuff here when you remember that this kind of match had never been done before at this point. We go to a graveyard where the Undertaker says the wounds he suffered at Summerslam have just begun to heal, but he does have one scar that he'll carry for all eternity. The scar of betrayal. Undertaker says that mankind learned who the true master of mind games was last night, and that the next In Your House pay per view, the Undertaker will bury mankind alive. After this promo, we go backstage where Doc Hendricks is stood outside Razor and Diesel's locker room. Doc announces that Razor Ramon will face Savio Vega next week on Raw before trying to go through the door. Razor Ramon closes the door and we don't get a good look at Razor or Diesel's faces. Over on Nitro, Jim Duggan comes down to the ring first, but Big Ron Studd gets stopped by Hulk Hogan. Hogan asks Ron if the NWO can take this match, and Ron agrees. Even though Big Ron was playing ball, Hogan and Nash decide to attack him anyway, and Scott Hall asks the guys in the truck to play the NWO's theme song. Scott Hall then says this. Go with it, the soundtrack from your favourite adult movie, brought to you by the NWO. The Giant then announces that Jim Duggan's opponent has been changed to Six and Nick Patrick is going to be our referee. Duggan tries to attack Six and Patrick with his 2x4, but Six is able to take advantage when Duggan goes after the referee. The advantage does not last long at all because Duggan begins no selling and Six takes a beating. Six takes a hip toss before Duggan begins clubbing his opponent's back. Bischoff gets excited on commentary that an NWO guy is getting pummeled in the ring and Duggan keeps up his momentum with a clothesline. Hulk Hogan on commentary tells Six to show Duggan what he's made of. Duggan does not let Six get in any offense at all and Hacksaw tries to end the match. The Giant pulls Duggan out of the ring and Jim takes an extremely weak choke slam. This didn't look good at all. Duggan gets rolled back into the ring and Six wins via pinfall. A poor first Nitro match for Sean Waltman here, but at the same time, nothing special at all happened on WWF Raw, so no points for either show. After the Six match, Bischoff asks the NWO what is it that they really want, and Hulk Hogan says that the New World Order wants it all. NWO Sting vs Bo Ledoux next on Nitro sounds fucking wonderful. While the WWF presents Hunter Hearst Helmsley vs The Stalker, a match that sounds much better if we call it Barry Windham vs Triple H. Steve Austin provides commentary and he's here to provoke Bret Hart. Austin says that Bret will have to answer to Stone Cold and if he has to keep poking the bear every week then so be it. 
Helmsley's poor valet looks like she's completely lost, almost as if she didn't know she was going to be at a wrestling show tonight. Out comes Wyndham and our match gets underway. Helmsley keeps backing off into the corner and the referee is forced to keep the stalker away. When the two eventually get physical, the stalker gets the upper hand. Wyndham begins working over Hunter's arm and wrist as Austin continues to provoke Bret Hart. The stalker slams Hunter right on his arm and Hunter manages to turn things around for a moment by raking his opponent's eyes. But Wyndham replies with a backdrop, Helmsley is getting completely destroyed here. Triple H throws Wyndham out of the ring and that was a mistake. The stalker rams his opponent's head into the steel steps and when both competitors get back in the ring, Mr. Perfect shows up again. Hunter manages to move out of the way when Wyndham charges into the corner and Helmsley then complains to the referee that Mr. Perfect should not be near the ring during this matchup. We come back from a commercial break and Helmsley chokes Wyndham in the corner. Hunter nails a knee drop as Kurt Hennig looks on. Triple H applies a sleeper but the stalker gets out with a jawbreaker. And then Steve Austin just totally tells everyone that the stalker is actually Barry Wyndham. I mean, we all knew it was of course but it's still pretty funny to hear Steve completely shatter the gimmick. As far as Barry Wyndham's concerned, the stalker, why the hell has he got all that pain on his face? I know who he is, everybody else knows who he is. Helmsley takes the flare bump in the corner before getting floored by Wyndham. Hunter then counters a headlock with a side suplex and Wyndham answers with a vertical suplex. Mr. Perfect makes his move on Hunter's valet and this causes Triple H to get distracted. Wyndham then hits his superplex finisher and it's over. The Stalker defeats Hunter Hearst Helmsley on Monday Night Raw. The bogus Sting tries to get the crowd amped up but he gets booed relentlessly. Bo takes a face crusher at the very start of the match. Bo gets back to his feet and he does manage to get a few strikes in the corner but that's it. That's as much as he's gonna get in tonight. NWO Sting drops Bo across the top rope as the crowd stays absolutely silent. Nobody gives a fuck about this at all. We see a stinger splash and then the scorpion deathlock gets applied. It's over 1 minute and 36 seconds. We go back to the commentary table and Hulk Hogan blows his nose on a Randy Savage bandana. And Hulk wonders if Miss Elizabeth is currently backstage tending to the macho man's wounds. Another point for WWF Raw, I get that as a whole the NWO takeover stuff is pretty cool to see. But when it's broken down segment by segment like this and compared with something else, then that's where the problems begin to arise. Jim Ross brings back an old favourite next on Raw. <laughs> While WCW Nitro ends their show with a tag team match, The Outsiders vs High Voltage. It was supposed to be The Amazing French Canadians, no not the Quebecers, The Amazing French Canadians taking on High Voltage here. But Pierre and Jacques don't seem too worried about letting Hall and Nash step in to face Kenny Chaos and... Fuck, what's his name? Uh, Robbie Rage, that's it. Scott Hall wins rock, paper, scissors, so he's gonna start things off. And check out this bump right here. Chaos gets out of a hammerlock with a back elbow and Hall answers by smacking the shit out of Kenny. We see some of those great Scott Hall punches before Chaos takes a clothesline in the corner and the bad guy continues to punish his opponent on the mat. Kevin Nash gets tagged in and a knee strike brings Chaos down. Kenny takes more strikes in the corner and a sidewalk slam gets delivered as Nitro takes its final commercial break. We come back and Scott Hall is bringing the pain to Chaos. Nash gets tagged back in and Kenny finally makes the hot tag. Robbie Rage jumps in and he gets put right down to the mat. This is as one sided as it gets folks. Rage gets hit with snake eyes and Scott Hall does a little work behind the referee's back. Hall gets tagged in and he delivers a discus punch followed by a fall away slam. And then Hall begins toying around with Robbie Rage. Nash tags back in after a few knife edge chops from Hall and the domination just continues. High voltage gets absolutely nothing in here besides that hammerlock at the beginning of the match. Scott Hall comes in again after Nash nails a big boot and then Robbie Rage lands really awkwardly on his arm after taking a back suplex from the top rope. 
He definitely got hurt here because Hall signals for the end of the match and Chaos, the fresher man, gets tagged in to take the finish. You can also see Nick Patrick tending the Robbie Rage. Kevin Nash hits a jackknife powerbomb and our match comes to an end. Nitro goes off the air with the NWO bragging about how they destroyed Monday Nitro and Scott Hall ends the show by asking the Giant a very important question. <laughs> I gotta know something, man. Hey, An is Andre really your dad, man? Andre really Sorry. your dad? <laughs> Jim Ross is in full-blown heel mode next on Raw. Before Jim brings out Diesel and Razor, he wants to get a few things off his chest. Jim Ross surprises everyone by saying he has no loyalty to the World Wrestling Federation and this gets a great pop from the audience. Jim says he left a great job broadcasting for the NFL in Atlanta back in 1993 to come and work for Vince McMahon and when he came to the WWF, he was expected to become the WWF's number one play-by-play -play guy. When Ross did indeed show up in person, he was put in a toga at WrestleMania 9 and this was embarrassing to good old JR. Ross says he went to the 1993 King of the Ring afterwards where he knocked it out of the park with his commentary. And because Vince McMahon got jealous, Jim Ross was not invited back to do play by play ever again. JR woke up on Super Bowl Sunday in 1994 and something wasn't right and it was his first troubles with Bell's palsy. Vince McMahon called Ross into his office shortly afterwards and Jim Ross says that he got fired. Jim got in his car wondering how he was going to break the news to his wife but it wasn't long before Ross was back in the WWF when Vince McMahon got indicted. Soon afterwards he was fired again and then he was rehired to work in the front office. And then Jim drops a bombshell and it's shocking how frequently people miss out on this next piece of detail. Jim Ross implies that it's because of his front office job that many WWF guys were able to leave recently. So what Jim is saying here is that it was actually he who provided all these ex-WWF guys, maybe NWO guys, with a chance to leave the WWF to go to WCW. This part was fantastic and there's some real creative stuff the WWF could have done with this. But then it happens. Jim Ross says he's going to bring back one of our old favourites, the bad guy Razor Ramon. So for some reason Diesel isn't getting brought out tonight but anyway, Razor's classic theme music plays in the arena and the crowd pops. And out walks Rick Bogner cosplaying as Razor Ramon. It's a fake, it isn't Scott Hall, it's a guy portraying the Razor Ramon character. And this was Vince McMahon's way of telling fans that the WWF owns the Razor Ramon and Diesel characters. Characters that Vince McMahon believed he spent too much time investing in for WCW to take away and capitalise on with this new World Order storyline. Sometimes you just gotta take a loss. And this is a classic case of cutting your nose off to spite your face. Fans hated it, it looked so second rate. And if fans wanted to see the real Razor Ramon and eventually Diesel, then they could switch over to WCW Monday Nitro. Quick side note too, Hall and Nash actually benefited from this, believe it or not. WCW executives thought Hall and Nash had indeed signed with the World Wrestling Federation because their WCW contracts were still not legally finalised. And the outsiders were given even bigger contracts so they wouldn't jump back to the World Wrestling Federation even though they weren't going to. <laughs> you couldn't write this stuff. Raw goes off the air with Savio Vega attacking the fake Razor Ramon. I'm still giving the point to Raw though, not for the debut of the fake Razor Ramon, but for Jim Ross's promo beforehand. It was excellent. And that Outsiders vs High Voltage bout was nothing more than an extended squash match. Raw wins this week's episode of Reliving the War. As mentioned earlier though, as a whole, the NWO TakeOver stuff was great, but when broken down segment by segment and put up against Raw, it comes across worse than what it actually is. Still, Monday Night Raw was pretty good this week and even though the end is kinda infamous, the stuff with Jim Ross was fantastic. One of the first times the WWF blended reality into their storylines. 
Our overall scores are now 18 points to Raw, 26 points to Nitro and we've had 6 ties. In the television ratings, Nitro got a 3.4 while Raw only managed a 2. Who really sang with my baby tonight and who is the real Double J? We'll find out next week. Over on Nitro, the superstars of WCW have returned from Japan. Our main event features Rick Steiner taking on Chris Benoit. I hope you join me next week. Thank you so much for watching and take care.